It's betting time, baby. It's time to look at over-unders for schools across the country, for conferences across the country. They've been released. Who Vegas thinks is going to be good? Who thinks Vegas is going to be bad? Who thinks Vegas is going to be just flat out mid in 2024? has been released, and I think I, I have some strong opinions on some, and whether they are, I think the over-under is high, whether I think the over-under is low, or whether I think that is a really difficult over-under to predict, because I think it's going to be a, a somewhat difficult. There are there are programs that when you look at that over-under, you're like, ah, damn, that's a tough one. And there are some that you're like, hammer, hammer the over, hammer the under whether it's the way that the schedule plays out, whether it's the way that maybe you don't think uh, that team is getting the recognition that it deserves or they're bringing back more that you think is better than what Vegas does or they hit the transfer portal really hard or you like this coach and think, you know, they're the Mike Tomlin of college football that they're never going to go less than six and six in a bowl game. Whatever the case may be, you you can have really strong opinions on damn near everybody. And so today we're starting with my immediate reactions to the Big Ten over-unders. When you look at the now 18 schools who make up the Big Ten, their over-unders look like this. If you're watching on YouTube, obviously you can see them. But if you're listening on a podcast, Ohio State and Oregon are both at 10 and a half on the over-unders. Penn State and Michigan, nine and a half. There's a log jam at seven and a half. USC, Washington, Nebraska, Iowa, and Maryland are all seven and a half. Wisconsin is the lone six and a half over under. Rutgers, Northwestern, Michigan State, UCLA, Illinois, and Indiana are at five and a half. And then finally, Minnesota and Purdue are at four and a half on the over under win totals. I will I will tell you right now that there are some of these that I think are atrocious <laughs> that like really you think that or is it just flat out set up to get people to bet on those numbers with the express idea that like hey we're going to make some cash off people who think that Maryland's going to go what is it Maryland's going to go 8 and 4 they're going to make some money off people like that. Like, obviously, there are skyscrapers in the desert for a reason. <laughs> so the idea that, like, uh, I'm I'm going to be any smarter at this than they are is preposterous. It's poppycock. It's ridiculous. But, damn it, I'm going to try. I'm going to tell you what I think. So here we go. I'm going to give you my ideas on what Big Ten over-unders look like. The ones that feel high to me, that feel like, okay, nah, that's a lot. Oregon at 10 and a half wins feels high to me. You go from you're replacing your starting quarterback is kind of the big one for me. Like when you look at, okay, Bo Nix was a transfer because, and not because Bo Nix was a, came in and was your guy. Now I will say that the non-conference schedule for Oregon is not great. They play Idaho, Boise State, and at Oregon State. And their conference slate is not super difficult either. But they play Ohio State at home. They're at Michigan and home for Washington. Are there two losses in there? I think so, but I don't know. I don't know. It's just getting through... Getting basically the question is, is Oregon going to finish 11 and one or better? That's tough to do. So I think Oregon is a bit high. I think Michigan is in that same camp. Nine and a half for the Wolverines feels like a lot because not only are they replacing a quarterback like Oregon is with Bo Nix, Michigan is replacing damn near everybody. And their non conference schedule is significantly more difficult than Oregon's is Michigan's non-conference schedule is Fresno state, which is not a cakewalk by any stretch of the imagination. They probably still win that game handedly, but it's, it's still a, a is somewhat difficult of a group of five non-conference games. You can have their second game is against Texas at home. Now it's a home game but it's against the number 
it's the, the team who's going to be ranked either first or second in the AP poll to start the season. So Texas is going to have some big, some big shoes to fill. Or I, I beg your pardon, Michigan is going to have some big shoes to fill and you get kind of thrown into the fire at the start of the season against Texas. Then they play USC at home at Washington, home for Oregon at Ohio State. Like those, are there four losses in there? Are there three losses in there even? If they go nine and three, you're under. So nine and a half feels pretty high to me with Michigan. So I don't, uh, that's the kind of, the way I look at the the Wolverines is nine and a half feels pretty high. And then the rest that I think are pretty high are the, the teams that are on the lower ends, the Northwestern at five and a half. I feel like every year you think Northwestern's going to suck. They're okay. And every year you think Northwestern's going to be okay. They suck. <laughs> so coming off a year where the expectations were about as low as they could be for a power five program. Northwestern, things went really well for them. And so I feel like it's just almost one of those like, yeah, at, uh, it's just going to be one of those years where where Northwestern, the expectations might be like, hey, they're going to be all right. And then they are not all right. UCLA, five and a half. Uh, obviously, part of this is you, you lose you lose Chip Kelly um, as your head coach. You didn't have a stupendous season to begin with. So, and it's sort of similar with Oregon, right? Like you're leaving the Pac-12 where this past year was as good as any conference in America, and you're coming to the Big Ten where the perception is, you know, hey, it's a little bit tougher top to bottom. But for UCLA, five and a half, basically you're asking, will they win six games? Their non-conference schedule is Hawaii, at LSU and Fresno State. At, at, at Hawaii, at LSU, Fresno State. In addition to that, they play Oregon, at Penn State, at Nebraska, Iowa, at Washington, USC. It's a pretty difficult schedule, truth be told. I don't know that if, if they had played the extra, the 13th game that they could have gotten for uh, playing at Hawaii, I would say maybe. <laughs> maybe they could get to six wins. If they were playing 13 regular season games, maybe. But when your road trips for UCLA are at Hawaii, at LSU, at Penn State, at Rutgers, at Nebraska, at Washington, whew, that's a rough one. And your home games are Indiana, Oregon, Minnesota, Iowa, USC, Fresno State. It's not a great setup for the for the Bruins. Indiana, I think Kurt Signetti is going to do some nice things at, in Indiana, but I don't think it's going to be in 2024. Now, their non-conference is as bad as you can get for a Big Ten school. FIU, Western Illinois, Charlotte. There's probably three of the five and a half wins that they get to right there or that they're projected to right there, but at UCLA, Nebraska, Washington, Michigan, at Ohio State. It feels like that's that's a somewhat difficult stretch there of like, okay, you know what? Things maybe don't go just smashingly for the Hoosiers in 2024. And then finally, Purdue. I don't I don't know how Purdue constantly gets into these kind of back and forths where like they'll hire somebody that just is like a slam dunk, absolute monster, great hire. And then when that person leaves, they hire a dumpster fire and they slide back down to being not great. But it, it, Ryan Walters felt like a somewhat uninspired hire to me when they hired him to begin with. Now, again, somewhat like Indiana, the non-conference isn't super difficult. You start the season with Indiana State, FCS program, there's a W. They play Notre Dame at home. 
That's a loss. And then at Oregon State, Beavers are going to be back to back to your dad's Oregon State. But then you, you run into a, a schedule here where it's Notre Dame at Oregon, Nebraska at Wisconsin. Ugh, tough. You also play Oregon, Ohio State, and Penn State. Now they have games against Michigan State, Indiana, Northwestern, Illinois. Do I think they can win four games? Do I think they can win five games out of Indiana State, Oregon, Illinois, Northwestern, Michigan State, and Indiana? I don't know. I think it's four. I think they're four and eight. So I don't I don't have a great feeling that Purdue eclipses that over under like four and a and, and nobody wants to be in a spot where four and a half wins on a season is like <laughs> I don't know, man. That's a little high. Like that does not bode well for the expectations for your season, but four and a half when that feels like I don't think you I don't think you've got that even with an FCS school on the schedule, it's a bad spot to be in. The feels right category to me. Ohio State is at 10 and a half wins. Essentially, you are asking, are they going to win 11 games? Yes, I think so. Like, but 10, could they lose two games? When you look at the schedule, I don't think that's super outrageous to question if it's possible that they could lose two games. Got some somewhat difficult road trips at Oregon, at Penn State. Play Michigan at home. Outside of that, they don't have USC. Don't have UCLA. Don't have Washington. I mean, you look at the left column of the the six teams with the somewhat highest win totals on the schedule for Ohio State. They play Oregon. They play Michigan. They play Penn State. They don't play USC. Don't play Washington. They play Nebraska. But otherwise, it's not a murderer's row for the Buckeyes in the first year of the 18 team big 10. So does 10 and a half feel like the right number? Yeah. Cause you're not going to put it at 11 and a half. Cause then you're saying, okay, we're predicting them to finish perfect. And nobody generally gets predicted to finish perfect. So 10 and a half feels like the right number. Penn state at nine and a half feels like the right number to me. Start the season on the road at West Virginia, but then Bowling Green and Kent state at worst, you're two and one. The there's a stretch there of four games in September and early October. Kent State, Illinois, UCLA at USC. That's not a difficult schedule. Also, they're at Wisconsin, Ohio State, Washington, at Purdue, at Minnesota, Maryland. They don't play Michigan. They don't play Oregon. <laughs> they don't play Iowa. They don't play Nebraska. I think it's a solid it, nine and a half for Penn State feels like the right number of like it could. They are either 10 and two or they are nine and three. And that's where the casinos and the sports books make their money is that nine and a half number is a difficult one to project for Penn State. But it feels like that is the right number. Uh, Rutgers at five and a half wins feels like a right number to me, I think. Uh, and as well as Michigan State and Illinois. I think those are the teams that kind of benefit a little bit from the the Big Ten being divisionless now because Illinois doesn't play Washington. They don't play USC. They don't play Ohio State. They don't play. Uh, they do play Penn State. They, they they get a pretty easy Big Ten schedule with Michigan State and Minnesota, Purdue, Northwestern. You get some wins in there for Illinois. Michigan State has a completely new staff, and they've got maybe as rough of anybody with they get Ohio State at Oregon, at Michigan. But then at the end of the season, Illinois, Purdue, Rutgers, into Indiana, Illinois, Purdue, Rutgers is the final four for Michigan State. And their non-conference is Florida Atlantic, Prairie View A and M, and Boston College. Yeah, I like the I like the Spartans' chances of getting to six wins. 
but five and a half feels like the right number for a first year head coach. So I think those are the numbers that like, yeah, that makes that makes sense to me why you would set those numbers the way you set them. Because you can't project everybody to be like, okay, there's 12 and 0, uh, 10 and 2, 10 and 2, 9 and 3, 8 and 4, 6 and 6, 6 and 6, 6 and 6, 6 and 6, 3 and 9. Like it's just not, you got to get people to, to, to put some money on this. So you have numbers that don't make a whole lot of sense. And then the numbers that feel just like they are, they are low in the win columns to me. I think USC feel it's seven and a half. Is USC going to win eight games in 2024? I think so. Cause I think I, I get the idea of Lincoln Riley did not finish the season spectacularly. Right. Like things were not viewed as a smashing success with a Heisman Trophy winner at quarterback in 2024. Now, there are some people who will tell you they had the absolute worst defensive coordinator in college football as their defensive coordinator last year. And I think part of the looking at the 2024 schedule and USC basically, are they going to win eight games? Is that their non conference is pretty difficult. Their non conference is as difficult as anybody has. I would argue in college football, they've got a neutral site game against LSU to open the season on the Sunday before Labor Day. Then they play Utah State, which obviously isn't a barn burner, but the final game of the year is Notre Dame. And I, I, I realize who knows what Notre Dame is at the end of November, but on paper on February 12th, Notre Dame and LSU in your non-conference is somewhat difficult. Then you go at Mich- at Michigan. You play Penn State, you're at Washington, you're at UCLA, you avoid Ohio State, you avoid Oregon. So the two top dogs that are viewed as the over-under champions there in the Big Ten, USC doesn't play. And even if you say, hey, it's likely that they lose to both Notre Dame and LSU. I don't think that's a ridiculous argument to make. If they lose, basically, if they beat one of Michigan, Penn State, or Washington, they're at eight and four. So I think USC feels just slightly low. Like, I think I still believe in Lincoln Riley. And it might be one of those that, like, midway through the 2024 season, I'll be like, ah, you know what? This is Lincoln Riley in 2024 is going to be my Clemson in 2023, where I was hesitant to get off the bandwagon that Clemson could still return to being a dominant player in college football in 2023. Now, I think that ship has sailed. I I think it's over. And at some point, um, like, you have to deal with Dabo Sweeney, but that's a topic for another discussion. Probably later this week, we look at the ACC over-unders, but I will, I'm not ready to give up on Lincoln Riley. Like so many other people are. So I will believe that USC at seven and a half feels low. I worry that Washington is going to be the 2024 version of TCU in 2023, where they made the national championship game and everybody's like, Oh man, like this is a team that's still going to be really good. And they lose a bunch. But Washington is helped by a bad non-conference schedule. Weber State, Eastern Michigan, Washington State. And their conference schedule is not great. Northwestern, Rutgers, Indiana, Iowa, UCLA. Basically, if you're going to get to eight wins for Washington, you can lose to you can lose to Michigan, Iowa, Penn State, and Oregon and still be eight and four. Basically, there are five difficult games for them in the 2024 schedule in the Big Ten. Michigan, Iowa, USC, Penn State, Oregon. If you win one of those and don't lose to somebody that's the Rutgers, Northwestern, Indiana, UCLA bunch, you're eight and four. Washington feels low to me. Is it? Is it... A, a foregone conclusion that they lose all four to Michigan, USC, Penn State, Oregon? I don't think so. So Washington at seven and a half feels low to me. I think Nebraska is building towards something really good in the Big Ten with, with Matt Rule. I don't know that I don't know that Nebraska is building towards, you know, like Tom Osborne national championship level of program. 
I don't know that Nebraska is even I think Nebraska can get to that spot of being in that group of schools who can win the Big Ten once every four or five years. And that might be the ceiling it in Big Ten Nebraska, just because they don't have the ability to go into Texas and say, hey, if you come from Texas to Nebraska, you're going to play three or four or five games a year in Texas. Your family's going to be able to come see you, blah, blah, blah. You're not going to get that in the Big Ten. Like it's not something that the Big Ten offers Nebraska. But I think Nebraska is building something. I think Matt Rule is the right guy for the job, but at the same time, I thought Scott Frost was the same was the guy for the job at Nebraska. I think the numbers feel low for Minnesota just a little bit. Like, and I think it's easy to like somewhat forget about Minnesota just because there's just not a whole lot there for them to celebrate or be viewed as this, you know, potential juggernaut. And I don't think they are by any stretch of the imagination, but the non-conference Rhode Island, Nevada, North Carolina, are you two and one out of the shoot? Now they have a somewhat difficult conference schedule, Iowa, Michigan, USC, Penn state at Wisconsin, so you're banking on kind of a three a three run stretch there where like you get a win over UCLA, Illinois, Rutgers, and you hope you went two and one in the non conference. If you I, I would say they'll lose to North Carolina. I don't think that's an outrageous I don't think that's an outrageous take. If you're two and one and you win two, three Big Ten games in a schedule that features Iowa, Michigan, USC, UCLA, Maryland, Illinois, Rutgers, Penn State, Wisconsin, if you can beat USC, or you can beat UCLA, Illinois, Rutgers. There's five. So I don't, I think it feels just slightly low. I don't, I don't believe me. I'm not sitting here saying Maryland or Minnesota or any of these teams are like super underrated, that they're going to be nine and three and the darlings of the college football world. I don't think any of that. But Minnesota at four and five feels like, can, is there a path for them to get to five or six wins? I think so. Is there also a path for them to finish like two and ten? Maybe. I, I, I think I feel like P.J. Fleck is somewhat of a glorified cheerleader as the head coach of that program, and at some point that comes to a head. And whether that's in 2024 or not, I don't know. But I think they can get to five wins. And maybe that's something at the end of the year. I'll be like, how the hell did I thought Minnesota was going to get the five wins? But that'll be fun to look back on later and be like, oh, you know what? I didn't do very well with that. But that's the start of looking at the over-unders this week for the Power Four conferences in 2024. And we'll do more of that here later this week on the Daily Huddle. Appreciate you making us a part of your day, however it is, wherever it is you're doing. So if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Make sure you're getting all the great college football content that we're pumping out here on Saturday Glory. If you are listening to our podcast feed, drop a five-star review. It goes a long way in helping out the channel. See you tomorrow right here on the Daily Huddle with Saturday Glory.